Good morning and most welcome to Heidegger 1339 and we will today talk about self-regulation. This is to be compared to, well, the two different modes or Stimmungen we've been comparing before. Uh, broadly uh, speaking, the one uh, connected to the Newtonian paradigm, the left hemisphere or the standard model that is depicted by linearity, homogeneity, and putting that into contrast with periods heterogeneity and flux. I have these two graphs to compare. One is the straight line of linearity and the second one the fractal line of reality. How reality is built up of differences, not of homogeneity. Terms that will be touched upon is anti-fragility and this is the fractal capacity for humans to withstand the changing world and often this is called homeostasis in a world of change. And this is what self-regulation is about, bodily, mentally and spiritual homeostasis. Some names that of authors that has contributed is Jean Desity, Chris King and David Bader. There will also be a little exposure made by Jean Dumas Seero, who wrote indirectly about self-regulation. Start with a compilation made by John Dumasero, a very apt and clear summary of what self regulation is. Self regulation refers to your ability to manage, adjust to and recover <coughs> Thanks. Excuse me. to uh, recover from extreme situations. This can include emotional and psychological self-regulation and physiological self-regulation. It can be a conscious or unconscious process.
it can be useful to build awareness around how you self-regulate both consciously and unconsciously because our systems crave stasis equilibrium balance in order to function and relate optimally in the world. And that is whatever optimal is for you. It will be different for each person. It can be useful to build awareness around how you self-regulate. both consciously and unconsciously. Because our systems crave stasis. What is a healthy, optimally functioning human is designed to be able to return to stasis after a moment or period of stress or stimulation. We are designed to be able to adjust to the regular ups and downs of daily life. When we experience a stressful stimulus or situation, our nervous systems become activated. Throughout the day, from moment to moment we, we naturally move through a process of arousal and recovery We are generally able to recalibrate using our built-in and learned 
self-regulation tools and strategies. The bunny and the fox, the threat safety processing cycle. A bunny lazily munches on some clovers. It is relaxed and at ease. Suddenly, it notices a fox approaching. The bunny freezes for a moment, assessing the potential threat. Then quickly breaks into a run, racing to a safe place. Once it gets to a safe spot where the fox cannot enter, the bunny will lie down and shake. The shaking releases muscle tension and helps to process excess adrenaline. This process <clears throat> is the bunny's way of supporting its nervous system to recover and repair. So that it can go back to nibbling clovers and living its bunny life. We humans are also animals. So we have a similar physiological self-regulatory process. For our psychological and emotional 
self-regulation, we can also draw on interpersonal supports like telling a trusted friend about a stressful situation. Or getting a hug when we are sad or scared. Can you think of some examples from your own life of the ways that you self-regulate when you're in pain, discomfort or just feeling a bit off? In some circumstances, however, our innate process of recovery and repair gets interrupted. For some reason, we may learn that it's not okay to self-soothe like this or this and other manners or be supported when we are sad or angry or scared Our family or school or work culture may have certain rules around needing to toughen up for example or we learn that we have to hold it together for everyone else. The natural release of shaking or crying or getting a hug or moving when you need to move might not be modeled or accepted in certain situations. Without this support, 
our recovery cycle gets interrupted and we get stuck in an incomplete loop. And so we keep accumulating unprocessed cycles of energy. in our bodies until we reach a point where this way of being is no longer sustainable. This unprocessed energy can show up in your body as muscle tension. chronic fatigue, digestive issues, headaches and migraines, irritability musculoskeletal or postural issues holding yourself in a particular posture or shape, possibly for protection. My comment there, the Newtonian paradigm. Rain fog, the inab inability to think clearly and directedly. Vocal fatigue or hoarseness. Jaw tension. Tight or closed throat feeling. It all adds up. When we have persistent experiences of stress,
it can be taxing on our whole being taking a toll on our emotional psychological and physiological well-being we can get stuck in a habitual pattern of responding to stress even after the stimulus is no longer present. Even after the fox has disappeared. This stuckness can mean that we are functioning outside of our window of tolerance. Or our optimal arousal recovery zone. From here, we may push ourselves to do more or work harder when what we really need is support and rest. When we become dysregulated, in this way, <clears throat> we are unable to take in new information, which is the learning process, for instance, reading a challenging email or functioning physically efficient vocal coordination or safe lifting the way we are used to Your nervous system connects to all of your organs and tissues and automatic survival functions, including your heart, lungs and voice. It also controls your muscles, motor function and coordination of the cerebellum, our very thinking 
capacity. When you are dysregulated, all of your systems are impacted. including your circulation, breathing, sound making coordination, and the ability to express yourself fully and effectively. Muscular coordination can also be affected, especially if your system takes you into a protective holding or compressed body posture when it perceives a threat to your safety. In short, when you are attempting to do something as complex as singing while dysregulated, you may find that pushing or trying harder or practicing more is not working anymore. You may need to attend to your whole self-regulation first. The Alexander Technique can help you self-regulate by teaching you how to slow down, do less and reconnect yourself with your body. The skills of pausing, very important. Good. Sensing, awareness, and redirecting attention. You learn in an 80 lesson can support you to recalibrate after or 
during periods of overstimulation and stress. including helping to regulate your nervous system to bring you back to your optimal arousal recovery zone. Through verbal guidance and subtle hands on support from your AT teacher, each session supports you to bring new awareness to your whole self unity we use simple everyday movements like sitting, standing, <clears throat> walking, lifting, and lying down to illuminate the interconnectedness of your thoughts, actions, and muscular involvement coordination. We explore anatomy to clarify how you are constructed and how you can work with your human design instead of against it. for optimal efficiency of movement. We investigate how your attention and intention are inseparable from how you function in the world. So that you can better understand how to work with yourself rather than against yourself. You will gain tools to help you to ground yourself 
so that you come back to being a receptive listener. who can respond with flexibility and awareness in a wide range of situations. Including day-to-day -day activities like doing dishes and brushing your teeth. As well as specialized activities like teaching and recital. For example, you may discover that you've been working harder than you need to while you recite. In the Alexander Technique, we call this goal-oriented, perfectionistic, over-efforting, end-game. And it's a fairly common way that we get in our own way. Your new awareness of your end gaming coupled with an embodied experience of uh, how your shoulders relate to your hips has a releasing effect on your whole torso and breathing mechanism. also releasing something in your jaw giving you a new experience of talking with more ease and availability in learning to allow things to happen rather than doing them. A footnote from me compared to grasping, which I mentioned in 3037 and 3038. Grasping and doing sense they are very similar you get 
out of your own way and can, can be more available for expression and emotion. We will do a little exercise later, but I will just give a short demonstration. Hello, or hello. Hello. And that would mean increased vocal range. It would mean access to resonance. This is how your breast revertebrates. And there will be an avail availability for longer phrases. When you start to unravel your habitual responses and begin to notice how these responses have been impacting your body, you may find that you experience Posture changes as a result of your new awareness and new way of using yourself. While improved posture is not a goal of this work, you may experience this and other benefits from working on yourself in this way. After a series of Alexander Technique sessions, many people make new discoveries about themselves. This could include postural changes, reduced back pain, relief from pain, muscular tension, stiffness, breathe awareness and ease. more ease 
is working at the computer. Responding to stress and anxiety with more flexibility and availability. You could experience improved balance and coordination. Ease of movement and mobility. Preventing injury. Expanded attention span and increased focus and concentration. Whatever your reasons for exploring embodied work, such as the Alexander Technique, whether it's an interest in learning about your anxiety, addressing postural concerns, or investigating vocal issues, you will undoubtedly gain new perspectives about your innate wholeness. Which, in my humble opinion, is always a good thing. We learned earlier from DCT, among others, that the ability to project actions are connected to the motor cortex that is the part of our brain that regulates both movement and thinking. So movement and thinking are in the brain the very same thing. So to perform good thinking we also need to be in good shape when it comes to muscular tension and coordination. David Barder shows in his works how the cerebellum is the regulator of all human activity and dysfunction as he usually refers to is very close to dysregulation as I mentioned the inability to go back to homeostasis a position of equilibrium and we get 
stuck. This stuckedness, I would say, is the inability to change mood. You are only in one posture, one attitude. one stimmung an inability to think greater wider and more expanded in the two previous lectures i took up the idea that the Newtonian paradigm or if you like the typical Western thinking always includes narrowness, tension. It means taking one thing and isolate a bit like me directing all my attention just in one singular point. And we dub that principle pointillism to make a little bit fun about the art movement with the same name. It's a point like attention, but it is also a point like understanding of the world. An extended point without differences builds instability in the thinking system. Linearity and homogeneity is a malfunctioning cerebellum. It does not adjust for the internal, the endogenous changes as David Bader calls them, nor the exogenous changes. This is one stable, fixed, unchanged world that you need to tense to hold. You need to cut everything up out. Whereas the fractality of the real world. Chris Kings mentioned this as the truer reality. Why truer? Well, everything in the universe is fractal. Our wish to put in linearity and then expand the picture with one orthogonal vertical line and one third perpendicular third line are helping tools but they are not of the world. Our wish or our, if you like, illusion is both what causes the tension and what is the tension. 
This is how tension looks like. And it makes the build up, the development, because the cerebellum is a learning organ. It can develop all your life and make your thinking more advanced more detached from actual doing it. I need to infer a fourth person here. And that is Barbara Tversky. She showed how the first seeds of abstract thinking later came to be more detached, more higher level as the civilization process progressed. And I would say our writing system, our development of arithmetic, help to make thinking finer and finer. And more attuned to both details and the wider picture. Whereas modern man has sinking down to pure reactions. They are almost going back to the caveman, unable to regulate attention and to combine it with intention which is always present uh, I will um, take some questions and we'll keep it short pass after that uh, I didn't get the point with the fox uh, illustration uh, can what was the that you had in the beginning. Can you please say? Mm. Imagine that there is a bunny and the bunny discovers a fox. Okay. The fox hunts the bunny. The bunny takes cover, escapes the jaw of the fox. In the bunny's escape, several things has happened to the totality of the bunny. Let's call it the bunny's mentality and body. About a hundred different hormones, including cortisols, nor adrenaline and several others has been released into the system and when the rabbit is safe from harm it begins to shake in the shaking process the levels of stress and tension in the body are being released and uh, maybe after half an hour a rabbit is not a complicated organism it will be back in homeostasis it will have had performed 
some sort of self-regulation. Uh, the tensions in the body, in the rabbit, will be gone and the levels of hormones will be back to normal levels. And this will mean that the rabbit is fully functional. It will be able to have this broader attention and be able to survive the next possible threat and its body will be apt to escape once more. In humans, in modern humans, the shaking doesn't occur. We do not go back to homeostasis and therefore the heightened level of hormones lingers on and as I said the body is tensed and it releases it we do not release and uh, we try to comfort ourselves this is why I did this and I did this an ongoing process. Trying to get back to homeostasis. Yes. Uh, so I understand that this, uh, the difference between uh, the rabbit and an animal is that the animal, uh, that uh, the human being has a has discipline has to use discipline to be sane, safe and healthy while a rabbit doesn't have to have a discipline because it has this automatic okay now i get it good 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 it's an insight very good uh, the rabbit and all other animals as far as i know of course uh, have this automatic instinctual habit we used to have it but now we need to use, as I implied, and I will go into further in the less, next leg of the lecture, we can develop it. Human beings can self-regulate. And of course, you understand the importance because a rabbit that stays in the aggravated state will lose its attention and intention and that will be similar to losing one's thinking capacity in a human being short pause so i continue here and I will read, uh, I made a little graph on how the self-regulation system uh, works. As you might remember from earlier on, priming or forethought is very important in the work of uh, decity, imagining something or thinking about something before the action that is first to think and then go into action and if you think first if you prime there will be a possibility of something called performance control that's an ability to coordinate both thinking process and bodily coordination. After the performance, there will be a reflection on performance. And this will go into 
the next priming or forethought. This is, of course, very similar to the development made in human history, where we went from being a bit like the bunny, only reacting, and slowly, by using our hand, developing a system where we heighten thinking. We make thinking more abstract, more, say, less crude, more attuned, not as, how can I compare? A bunny doesn't have many different varieties of forefoot. For a bunny, it is just see, threat, and escape. We as humans have the potentials because of our unique history, because the development of decontextualization, recontextualization, our more advanced cerebellum, and of course, the history. Therein lies the knowledge. Let me extend the concept of self-regulation a bit more. Self-regulation is a relatively new and increasingly important area in psychological research. Since the 1980s, a very large number of scientific articles on self-regulation and various aspects and application of self-regulation and the self-regulation constructs including self-regulated learning self-control and self-management. Behavioral self-regulation and self-regulated learning designate one and the same process as there are no innate or spontaneous skills, nor automatic behavior regulation in human being, of course in contrast to the bone. Every skill you can think of is just the expression <clears throat> of a learned behavior at a moment in time. Now learning new things, new concepts, new procedures, new attitudes, new 
problem-solving capacities involves developing and coordinating many different skills. Expanding one's attention, making memory more voluntary, developing one's capacity of forming accurate representations. Coping with not knowing and uncertainty. Postponing satisfaction. Maintaining one's emotional drive setting goals organizing self appraisal Implementing intentions. Dealing with strategy failure. All these skills gain in <clears throat> efficacy and are more likely to work in a coordinated fashion when the learner is made conscious of the process of self-regulation. which I call Conscious Guidance. Self-regulation represents a set of purposive personal processes and actions directed at acquiring or displaying skill. By the expression <clears throat> purposive personal process. I mean a goal-oriented set of highly structured procedures which must be repeated in time and improved in the process. an effortful activity, not, very important, not inherently enjoyable, no motivating. The explicit goal of which is to improve the current level 
of sin is sitting. Which is to improve the capacity to construct and to obey series of rules in practice at the propitious moment and in a correct decisional architecture. The idea behind the lessons of the initial Alexander technique is that it is possible to make the whole process of self-regulation more conscious and to directly train our capacity of learning. It is learning how to learn. But not the learning how to learn stupid series of numbers or an even more stupid fixed conception of means whereby. Every person attempts to self-regulate its behavior <clears throat> in some way to gain goals in life. They are not going to call it self-regulation or conscious guidance. And they will do what they can without really knowing what it is or what really enters into self-regulation. Most people, for example, do not imagine that self-regulation is the greatest tool of emancipation, of setting oneself free of restrictions, cravings and fear. The most ignored axiom in this domain is that self-speech plays a central role in self-regulation. It is self-speech advancement and the refinement of its use that will thoroughly change the free cyclical phases self-regulation is made of.
no matter what skill is considered. And those are the aforementioned forefoot or priming, performance control, how you do it, and then, very important, self-reflection on performance. Learning to use speech, A, to give orders, which is forethought, and B, verify that these definite orders are obeyed. and no others, which is performance control. C, to construct models, which is reflection on performance. which will give our speech terminology a new architecture, is the central stepping stone of the growth to the highest stages of regulation. I had to extra, extra press on. That the orders thought of, the forefoot, that those get performed and nothing else. It is extremely important. If other things turns up, other movements, then you do not have conscious control. It is not great mystery that there are effective and ineffective forms of regulation. And that most people experience self-regulatory dysfunction. Learning blockages. Inattention. irrational self-judgment procrastination
addictions eating disorders irrational fears faulty gestural patterns Teaching conscious guidance is therefore more important in the sense that it is more general than transmitting a correct use of the anatomical structure. This said, my position is that one teaching our pupil ourselves first to concert decisions of movement is the best scene for covertly teaching self-regulation. Two as the performance of physical acts in everyday activities is one of the major sources of ineffective form of self-regulation leading to self-harm. It is obvious that using self-regulation to improve gestural self-preservation represents the best way to lift the mind of its prostration and find the energy and incentive to engage into the work of constructing for oneself a higher level of self-regulation. I consider teaching the initial Alexander technique as teaching a self-regulatory technique which uses the conscious guidance of movements as a springboard to the inquiry into conscious guidance.
I often employ the term conscious guidance as a synonym of reason self-regulation. When I say that the initial Alexander technique is a bridge between theory and practice, and that we study experimentally how each of us translate concerted verbal orders of movements into coordinated actions. I have in mind the process definition of agency or ability defined by Zimmermann. Alexander was very close to this vision. When he advised his teachers to make our technique true to the principle of growth. And development. Not teaching people some trick or another, but helping them to develop their own agency, that is, their own capacity of continuous self-regulated learning. So this, for this process to be working, it needs to be performed to each specific detail. And performance control, as I mentioned last, is very important because nothing else should be done. There needs to be a parallel between priming and what later is performed. No other actions are allowed. None. Why is it so? Well, if other actions are performed, they are bound to be not conscious because they were not part of the plan. This needs to be 100% clear. Any action that is not part of the forefoot is to be eradicated. Otherwise, there is no consciousness. Consciousness is performing things that you thought before. I will get back to this in a later lecture, but this is very important. Although it is extraordinary simple, it is still very hard to get. I, for myself, I think the reason is, at least that was in my case, 
is that I assume that my actions are somehow conscious. This needs to be questioned. And I earlier brought up during the lecture series Kahneman and Hari Yuvari, who shows clearly that our actions are today mostly irrational. They are chance. And I would say this is also the take from the left hemisphere. Let me read a quote here from Bukertz. It's another name. Self-regulation as self-generated thoughts, feelings and actions. Self-regulation refers to self-generated thoughts, feelings, and actions. Self-monitoring, forethought, planning strategies, modeling, ordering, and obeying orders. experimenting that are planned and cyclically adapted to the attainment of personal goals. This definition in terms of actions and covert processes whose presence and quality depends on one's beliefs and motives. Differs from definitions emphasizing a singular trait, ability, or stage of competence. A process definition can explain why a person may self-regulate one type of performance, but not another. This personal agency formulation also differs from metacognitive views of self-regulation that emphasize only knowledge states and deductive reasoning when, for example, choosing cognitive strategies. Although metacognition plays an important role, self-regulation also depends on self-beliefs and affective reactions such as doubts and fears about specific performance contexts. This is Bokets and Zimmerman.
coming from their book of self-regulation. All references will also be in the description of the YouTube channel. For me, this, the self-regulation is obviously a trait of the left hemisphere, as I see, this is my take. But I would say it's a hidden door to the right hemisphere. We are using regulatory processes to reach into a new domain, which is conscious control. And this, very, very important, is a stepwise process. It doesn't go in one, so to speak, now, as we have in the Newtonian paradigm. It sees the world to be different, never the same. It's an iterative process. It's not, as I would say, repetitive in the way unconscious behaviors is repetitive. An example of repetitive behavior is my own way of brushing my teeth, starting with the upper, going to the inside. I noticed going the other way around is more effective. That is starting with the downside. This is nothing less than higher thinking. It is taking in the holes so we also can become definite. We are using the left hemisphere in the way it can do its thing, things the best, to be precise. And I had to add, this is my comment, put this in double parenthesis, so to speak, in this first sequence, ignore reality. But in the later sequence, opening up to reality. Only when we are functioning well, we will be able to take in reality that is being in the right hemisphere. Uh, I see a lot of connections here, uh, apart from what we mentioned earlier. How the thinking processes have eroded, that is something we mentioned many times, but the discovery of a conscious control can actually bring us higher than we ever were. Ted Diamond has produced magnificent research that we can be able to strive even higher than our forefathers. So we can get out of the sloop that we are experienced now and we can reach higher than what used to be the case. We have been relying on instincts of the bunny too long. Those instincts, I'm afraid, are long gone. They do not serve their purpose anymore. And uh, I will have uh, some questions and I wonder if I could borrow my dear colleague here for a very short, swift experiments.
But first, maybe there are some questions or... Uh... Um, no, I, I want to have a practical demonstration. And then I thought myself, uh, after uh, the demonstration that you choose, I have my own proposal that is... Um, I can explain it later, after this demonstration. So let's take a break here. So this will be a very swift demonstration of the special and uh, I ask the subject to look forward, get up, sit down, what we saw here was an immediate reaction to my command of get up and sit down, it was mostly obvious in the neck region. This is direct reaction to an exogenous, with a more common word, outside stimuli. And the idea with priming is, in the process, which takes time, it should take time, learn to not react. This is a learning process and uh, it will be developed if you prime yourself with an image of going up only when you give the commando. This has been likened earlier how to learn things yourself. You can compare it with a person that learns to knit. He no longer needs to ask someone else to knit. So the instinctual way or reflective is trusting the environment to give you a cue move and then you move self-regulation means that you decide and that can only be done as libertium by priming and of course <laughs> this takes training so the second part of uh, the exercise is just to show how it can look from the outside. Of course, my dear colleague needs to train this in months, but we will still do it for the clearance. Look forward, please continue. And now I will put an image into you. And that image is that there is a lot of space behind you. What I could see in the first example was that your whole attention was forward. There was nothing in the back. I could see the back to be hollow. The back will become full. Yes, it's already happening. The, be the back becomes full once you put attention to the in what we usually regard in the Newtonian paradigm as insignificant behind. This is priming going down. To the behind, I want you to also, in your image, add the above. You can think of an airplane passing from the local airport of Landwetter, going to Reykjavik. And now you prime yourself to be in. And I would still give an order to get up, but you get up on your own intention. 
So see how much reaction it will be when I give the order. Get up. Sit down. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kale. Do get up. So I have to. I have to uh, point to this is of course a month-long training, months-long training. But we can learn it, and uh, as my dear friend Jan Eisken showed scientifically and by collected research reports, it is a skill that can be developed. And the a positive part is it can be seen from the outside, but it is also an endogenous process that in the end will lead to control of thinking. So the thoughts do not appear in the head by themselves, which we think to be natural. But a well-trained bunny or cerebellum, the little brain, will produce the thoughts that fit the situation. So this is mainly a training of the cerebellum, but it would lead in the long run to a brain that is controlled and a controlled consciousness, or even better put, a consciousness. Did you have some questions, Ekale? You must yes, welcome. I was thinking about an exercise, um, I can sit here, uh, in order to kill several birds with one stone. Uh, and train this self-regulation and train my city bones um, but also my hand that is calligraphy and my memory so you would have three birds if you <laughs> if you were able to sit correctly and please uh, correct my sitting if I'm not sitting correctly so I could write something and um, uh, just when you sit down, you should mm. never pick up the pen directly. Oh, okay. And... Uh, so check that the video camera. Okay. Yes, mm. it's... When you sit down, never pick up the object, whether it's a pen or a book or a computer or... It could be anything. So you first make sure that you are sort of primed. Mm. And you only do that. Mm only and what you do by priming here is think of the behind and of the up and then send a little thought to the contact between your body and the seat of the chair just think it just think it for a second Yeah, it's already a difference. So by sending these first, the behind, then the above, and then the sitting bone, you start a simple procedure, but it's better to start simple. This is priming. And then pick up the pen or whatever object you want to engage in. Already there's a better coordination. And that is the second thing, that is the performance control. I think as time goes, you will notice the difference more and more. This is the idea with the second leg performance control you will notice that you don't do things you didn't think. Mm. You only do the things that you thought before. 
Yes, it sounds absolutely simple, but trust me, this is very hard to learn because we have never done it before. And this is why I would say conscious control is in a way an invention. And that our forefathers who were better aligned, better coordinated, didn't use conscious control because their instincts were still trustworthy. They hadn't been disrupted by whatever things it could have been. Modern world, Newtonian paradigm. There are many factors. But by going into self-regulation, we will use the one thing that we know is still working, the left hemisphere. It's in good working condition without a doubt. And if we follow strict discipline, it can be put to a most effective work. So what you proposed, I see no obstacles for that to be working well. And later, when you're using your hand, you will be able to prime also the hand. Mm. Mm. And here I recommend that you go stepwise, but I, I will just give examples what you can do with your hand. You can imagine the fingers to be elongated. Just think it, just think it, uh -huh. and such things. And there are marvelous uh, books for that. I got all of them. But I would say, especially Barbara Conneville is useful there to do calligraphy. Very good idea. I approve. If you want, you can finish off by writing something. And this is a more relaxed posture. It gives a sense of tranquility and ease. Writing becomes less strained, less of a doing. Remember Ian McKilchrist grasping? Thank you very much, Kalle. Bye-bye for now.